The theme of our lecture for today is the Renaissance in English Literature, Elizabethan Age, Thomas More and Christopher Marlowe. Objectives. By the end of the lecture, students should be able to explain the history of the Renaissance, give a brief biographical sketch of Thomas More, discuss the social conditions when Utopia was written, critically analyze the poem Utopia, explain More's concept of an ideal society, give a brief biographical sketch of Christopher Marlowe, discuss the life and works of Christopher Marlowe, summarize Marlowe's play Edward II, and critically analyze the tragical history of Dr. Faust. During this lecture, we are going to discuss the following questions. The first one, the Renaissance, humanism, and its progressive ideology. Characteristics of the Elizabethan age, the blossom of Elizabethan literature, the Elizabethan theater, and the last one is the great dramatists Thomas More and Christopher Marlowe. After the period of the 15th century, a new epoch in life and in art appeared known as Renaissance. This period was a special phase in the cultural and economic development between the 14th and 17th century. Various events changed the intellectual and moral attitude of people. Superstitions born of ignorance and fear of the unknown gave way to knowledge. Men saw the world in a new light. Many discoveries happened at that time in many spheres of social life, science, economy, and culture. Various fields of knowledge began to develop, especially philosophy, history, and languages. They were called humanities. The writers, painters, scientists were called the humanists. The 15th and 16th century are the period of the European Renaissance of new birth, one of the three or four great transforming movements of European history. This impulse by which the medieval society of scholasticism, feudalism, and chivalry was to be made over into what we call the modern world came first from Italy. Italy, like the rest of the Roman Empire, had been overrun and conquered in the 5th century by the barbarian Teutonic tribes. But the devastation had been less complete there than in the more northern lands and there even more perhaps than in France. The bulk of the people remained Latin in blood and in character. Hence, it resulted that though the Middle Ages were in Italy a period of terrible political anarchy, yet Italian culture recovered far from rapidly than that of the northern nations. From the Italians continued down to the modern period to regard contemptuously as still mere barbarians. In the 14th and 15th centuries further, the Italians had become intellectually one of the keenest races whom the world has ever known, though in morals they were sinking to almost incredible corruption. Already in 14th century, Italy therefore the movement for a much fuller and freer intellectual life had begun, and we have seen that by Petrarch and Boccaccio something of this spirit was transmitted to Chaucer. In English, in English Chaucer was followed by the medievalizing 15th century, but in Italy there was no such interruption. The main new ideology came into being new thinking called humanism. The main feature of this ideology showed that the main interest lay in man and not in religion as it was before. Latin and Greek were very developed and took a prominent place in education. Renaissance firstly developed in Europe. It was associated with Francis Bacon and Thomas More in England, Rasmus of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and Copernic in Poland. The literature as well as the fine art taught that man was not an evil, as the church had taught, but he had the right to live, enjoy himself and develop his talent. Unlike the church dogmas, the ideology of Renaissance taught that the happiness of man was on the earth, it depended on his own strength and mental ability 
to achieve it. Man was to be in his own guide to truth, justice and happiness. The earlier half of Elizabeth's reign also, though not lacking in literary effort, produced no work of permanent importance. After the religious convulsions of half a century time was required for the development of the internal quiet and confidence from which a great literature could spring. At length, however, the how grew ripe, and there came the greatest outburst of creative energy in the whole history of English literature. Under Elizabeth's wise guidance, the prosperity and enthusiasm of the nation had risen to the highest pitch, and London in particular was uh, overflowing with vigorous life. A special stimulus of most intense kind came from the struggle with Spain. After a generation of half piratical depredations by the English sea dogs against the Spanish treasure, feats, and uh, the Spanish settlements in America. King Philip, exasperated beyond all patience and urged one by the bigots' zeal for the Catholic Church, began deliberately to prepare the Great Armada, which was to crush at one blow the insolence, the independence and the reign of England. There followed several long years of breathless suspense. Then, in 1588, the Armada sailed and was utterly overwhelmed in one of the most complete disasters of the world's history. Thereupon, the released energy of England broke out exultantly into still more intemptuous achievement in almost every line of activity. The great literary period is taken by common consent to begin with the publication of Spencer's, Spencer's calendar in 1579 and to the end in some sense at the death of Elizabeth in 1603, though in the drama at least it really continues many years longer. Several general characteristics of Elizabethan literature and writers should be indicated at the outset. The period has a great variety of almost unlimited creative force. It includes works of many kinds in both verse and prose, and ranges in spirit from the loftiest platonic idealism of the most delightful romance to the level of very repulsive realism. It was mainly dominated, however, by the spirit of romance. It was full also of the spirit of dramatic action, as befitted an age whose restless enterprise was urgently extending itself to every quarter of the globe. In style, it often exhibits romantic luxuries, which sometimes take the form of elaborate affections, of which the favorite concern is only the most apparent. It was in part a period of experimentation when the proper material and limits of literary forms were being determined. It continued to be largely influenced by the literature of Italy and to a less degree by those of France and Spain. The periods of the beginning of English prose fiction of something like the later modern type first appeared a series of collections of short tales chiefly translated from Italian authors, to which tales the Italian name novella was applied. Most of the separate tales are crude or amateurish and have only historical interest, though as a class they furnished the plots of many Elizabethan dramas, including several of Shakespeare's. The most important collection was Painter's Palace of Pleasure in 1566, the earliest original or partly original English prose fiction to appear were handbooks of morals and manners in story form, and here the beginning was made by John Lilly, who is also of some importance in the history of the Elizabethan drama. In 1578, Lilly, at the age of 25, came from Oxford to London, full of the enthusiasm of Renaissance learning, and evidently determined to fix himself as a new and dazzling star in the literary sky.
The medieval religious drama had been written and acted in many towns throughout the country and was a far less important feature in the life of London than of many other places. But as the capital became more and more the center of national life, the drama with other forms of literature was more largely appropriated by it. The Elizabethan drama of the Great Period was altogether written in London and belonged distinctly to it. Until well into the 17th century, to be sure, the London companies made frequent tours through the country, but that was chiefly when the prevalence of the plague had necessitated the closing of the London theatres or when, for other reasons, acting there had become temporarily unprofitable. The companies themselves had now imbued a regular organization. They retained a trace of their origin, in that each was under the protection of some influential noble and was called, for example, Lord Leicester's servant or the Lord Admiral's servants. The structure of the Elizabethan theatre was naturally imitated from its chief predecessor, the Inn Yard. There, under the open sky, opposite the street entrance, the players had been accustomed to set up their stage. About it, on the three sides, the ordinary part of the audience had stood during the performance, while the inn guests and persons able to pay a fixed price had sat in the open galleries which lined the building and ran all around the yard. In the theatres, therefore, a first gallery square, octagonal, the stage projected from the rear wall well toward the center of an unroofed, where still on three sides of the stage, the common people admitted for six pence or less stood and jostled each other, either going home when it rained or staying and getting wet, as a degree of their interest in the play might determine. The enveloping building proper was occupied with tiers of galleries, generally two or three number, provided with seats, and there of course sat the people of means, the woman avoid, avoiding embarrassment and annoyance only by being always masked. Behind the unprotected front part of the stage, the middle part was covered by a lean uh, to roof spalling down from the rear wall of the building and supported by two pillars standing on the stage. This roof concealed a loft from which gods and uh, goddesses or many appropriate properties could be let down by mechanical devices. Still further back under the galleries was the rear stage which could be set uh, could be used to represent inner rooms, and that part of the lower gallery immediately above it was generally appropriated as a part of the stage, representing such places as city walls or second stories of houses. The musician's place was also just beside in the gallery. In the stage, therefore, was a platform stage seen by the audience from almost all sides, not as in an our own time. A picture stage was its sense viewed through a single large frame. This arrangement made impossible any front curtain, though a curtain was genuinely hung before the rear stage from the floor of the gallery. Hence, the changes between scenes must generally be made in full view of the audience, and instead of ending the scenes with striking situations, the dramatist must arrange for the withdrawal of the actors only either by stage hands or as a part of the action by other characters in the play. The actual course of the religious movement was determined largely by the personal and political projects of Henry VIII. Conservative uh, at the outset, Henry even attacked Luther in a pamphlet, which won from the Pope for himself and his successors the title De Fat of the Faith. But when the Pope finally refused Henry's demand for a divorce from Catherine of Spain, which would make possible a marriage with Anne Boleyn, Henry angrily threw off a papal authority and declared himself the supreme head of the church in England, thus establishing the separate English church. 
In the brief reign of Henry's son, Edward VI, the separation was made more decisive under Edward's sister Mary. But the last of Henry's children, Elizabeth's coming to the throne in 1558, gave the final victory to the English communion. Under all this story, the more radical Protestants, Puritans, as they came to be called, were active in agitation, uh, undertone by frequent cruel persecution and largely influenced by the corresponding sets in German in Germany and by the Presbyterian established by Calvin in Geneva and later by John Knox in Scotland. Elizabeth's skillful management long kept the majority of the Puritans within the English church, where they formed an important element working for the simply practices and introducing them in uh, congeneries which they controlled. But toward the end of the century of the Elizabeth's reign, feeling grew tenser. The groups of the Puritans, sometimes under persecution, defiantly separated themselves from the, from the state church and established various sectarian bodies. One of such scholars was Thomas Moore, born in 1479 in London, educated at Oxford, where he could write an excellent Latin. He began his life as a lawyer. During the reign of Henry VII, he became a member of Parliament. He was an active-minded man, kept an eye on the events of his time. He saw the hard life of common people and tried to change it. He wrote many articles on social and political subjects. Fourteen years later, when Henry VIII came to the throne, Moore was made Speaker of the House of Commons. Moore was an honest Catholic. He wasn't liked by the church because of his writings. When Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, refused him. So uh, Henry VIII became the head of his own Anglican Church. At that time, Moore was made Lord Chancellor. He didn't want his post because he was against the king's absolute power. He refused uh, to swear to the king, and thus he was thrown to the tower. Parliament declared more guilty of treason, and he was beheaded in 1535 in the tower. Uh, despite the fact that he lived uh, not a long time, he managed to write the works which made him well known all over the world. His writings include discussions, discuss, discussions on political subjects, biography, and poetry. Utopia is written first in Latin in 1516. The word utopia came from Greek and means now here, but in this book it means a non-existent island. The title was chosen to show not openly the facts that took place in England at that time. The book consists of two parts. The first, a profound and uh, Sourceful picture of the people's suffering. He points out the social evils existing in England at that time. His ideal of the future society describes a, a perfect social system built on that island, which one of the personages of the book, a sailor, had described to more. He opposed the very state of things in England to that on island Utopia. The state on the island was the Commonwealth or Republic. The author speaks of all good laws or orders on that island. There is no private property, people own everything, it common and enjoy complete economic quality. Everybody cares for his neighbor's good, and each has a clean and healthy house. Labor is the most essential feature in their life, but no one is overworked. Everybody is engaged in useful work nine hours a day. After work, they indulge in sport and games and spend much time in improving their minds. All teaching is free and parents don't pay any school fears. For authorities, the utopians choose men whom they think most fit to protect their welfare. When electing their government, the people give their voices secretly. There are few laws and no lawyers at all, but these laws must be strictly obeyed. Thomas More says that virtual life according to nature. The greatest of all pleasures is health. Men must be healthy and wise. There are so-called uh, slaves who were criminals 
those who did some indecent things but they have the right to be a free citizen when they improve their behavior and their children are enslaved. Those slaves were marked with golden things. Gold was something indecent there. The book was the first literary work in which the ideas of communism appeared. It was highly estimated by all the humanists in Europe at that time and grew very popular with the socialism in the 9th century. As for literature, it was the book which opened a new literary game genre. It was fantastic. This period marked the first early period of Renaissance. The most significant period of Renaissance fall to the reign of Queen Elizabeth. England was in the peak of its prosperity. That period is known as Elizabethan era. It was characterized by the development in many fields of science, art and literature, especially English poetry. People not only from rich families but from the middle class tried to get education. The children from middle class managed to get education at universities. They had to be a churchman, prides, but many of them refused to become a churchman. They wanted to be writers and dramatists. These students and graduates were under great influence of the classical education. Many of them wrote in Latin and Greek. These men were known as the university wits. Among them were Christopher Marlowe, John Lilly, and Robert Greene. The leader was a, a very famous nobleman, Earl of Leicester Sir Walter Raleigh. He was not only a talented poet and historian, but a traveler. He was known for his free thinking. It was he who united those students. That was a new stage of development of English drama. Before, there were three main dramatic genres. Mysteries, episodes from the Bible. Miracles from the lives of saints, moralities or moral plays, they taught people how to live. But when the university wits appeared, the character of English drama changed. The new drama represented real characters and the real human problems which met the requirements of the common people. Almost all dramas were written in verse. Christopher Marlowe was born in Canterbury in the family of a showmaker. His father wasn't rich to afford his son to send him to a private school. He entered the Canterbury Grammar School at 14. On graduating, he won a scholarship for Cambridge University, which gave him the right to get free education after exams. At that time, the University of Cambridge was no longer a school devoted to theology. Most of the students studied Greek, Latin, classical literature and were prepared for being priorists. Marlowe was interested in the classics and his translations from Greek were the best. They had attended the group of university wits. The members were influenced by the ideas of Renaissance, but at the same time they discussed also religious and psychological questions. They were known as free thinkers. Marlowe hated religion because it cramped at individuality and even he began no doubt in the existence of God. He believed in the pow power of strong individuality. After the university, he went to London and tried his luck as an actor but without success. From that time, he took to writing plays. He, um, the London playwrights were his contemporaries, those university wits. Marlowe was very talented and was the first in England to approach history from the political viewpoint. It was the time when people began to think of social political problems. The main dramas are the tragical history of Dr. Faust, Tamburlaine the Great, the Jew of Malta, Edward II. He showed his characters as very powerful individualities. He showed power from different angels. The power of knowledge, Dr. Faust, the imperial power, Tamburlaine, the power of money, Jew of Malta, and the loss of power, Edward II. They tried to use power not for the good of people, but for their own selves only. It brings them to all misery and finally they perish. 
As for Dr. Faust, it was dramatization of medieval legend of a science who sold his soul to the devil Mephistopheles. Dr. Faust was ambitious to conquer knowledge and learning, and knowledge and learning were sold by him to gain power over the world. He makes an agreement with Mephistopheles, he travels to different European countries and plays a series of tricks with him. In the end, Faustus wanted to return his soul, but it was impossible, and he died. Christopher Marlowe was wrote some poetry which was lyrical, expressive, and colorful. At that time, church had become part of the state of Marlowe was against the church and the state. Christopher Marlowe was suspected of being disloyal, and quarrel was provoked in one of London's inns where he was killed in a fight with danger. One of the versions says that he was killed by an agent of the Royal Private Committee. This is the end of our lecture. Here in this very slide you can see the questions for self-checking. Here, given the glossary and the terms concerning our lecture. Here, given the literature for further reading.